this is a catty kid. When I was going to grade school, because I was the only kid that came there that had bloomers, you know, Knickerbocker suits, you know, my auntie, my stepmother, I had to be dressed up, you know, like nobody said. So those days when I came there and I got these kids that took at me, you know, I was the only well-dressed kid amongst them, you know, what they call well-dressed. And these Knickerbockers and, and my hair was combed every day, you know, my face washed and all that sort of thing. And they said, well, it was a dish of a candy kid, you know. Now, you know, it's something funny. I think it may be the weather. Now, yesterday, I, could, I walked the whole block, and I didn't have any pain in my leg. Oh, today, yeah. And today, see, it'll, it'll go away, though. I get myself, I'm not kidding myself, and I'm not trying to be a hero when I tell you this, but I think I've got about two more years to live. Very lucky. You can't go on living forever, you know, you've got to die sometime. never voted in my life. <laughs> I don't get letters from these, you know, uh, guys that are running for office. And I used to take her down here. They used to have a voting place in one of the houses. And some of the friends said, why didn't you vote? I said, what for? I said, it's a matter we get in there. Let's make a bit of difference as far as the the economic situation, one clip is bigger than the other. I'm not interested. I've never been into a booth, into a voting booth. They asked me if I'm a Democrat or a Republican. So when I want to give them a shocker, I say I'm a honey. <laughs> But I said with a laugh, so they don't take me seriously. <laughs> Look at this, huh? Well, we had to call the neighborhood house. You know, Jane Adams had, you know, in Chicago, a neighborhood house. Gertrude Morrell was the one that came in from Chicago and had this house. For the poor people, children, you know, to come to play and what have you. We lived in a poor neighborhood, see. And uh, we used to go down to this neighborhood house. And they, we had a club that we called the Aurora Club. It started off with 12 members, and we finally got up to 20 members. And we'd meet every week, you know, have regular meetings with the president, what have you. Anyway, we'd meet there, and then we used to play basketball. And they, uh, it wasn't in a hall, it was outside, you know. The basket on this end and the basket on that end, we used to get out there and play. And then we had what they call, we gave a, I think it was a dancer. Yeah, no, there was a dancer, and Helen came down there. They had it for the girls, and they had it for the boys in the neighborhood, and Helen came down there, and I met Helen down at the dance. And at this one dance there. She came over from South St. Paul with some other girl or something, and she knew some of those girls and that lived on the west side, because she went the, to the Humboldt High School, and they would meet up there. And I went as far as the eighth grade, and I didn't even wait to get the diploma. 
We got married the day after the armistice. We went to New York and got married. So that was it. Then uh, 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 Helen became pregnant with uh, Morty. Morty. And we came back uh, to Minneapolis. And I came back as a married man, and she came back as a married woman. From that time on, it was hell. <laughs> and we, then we started having the kids. <laughs> then we stopped having the kids. And that's about it. You know, I left telling you, I don't know if you remember that. You know why? She threw a plate at me. That's right. Everybody says, give me a tell me you're too afraid of you. I said, yeah. She just took that place and got mad, you know, it's like something that didn't bother anything. Too afraid. I'd probably could sort have of had a better relationship with her. But I didn't. So now I have the memories. So. They had a club there in Chicago. They called the uh, 606 Club. And radicals met there. We would call the radicals, you know, because it was socialist. And they ha had people there, artists, you know, and and uh, people that were interested in the politically, and they get up and give a speech, you know. So one night we were there, oh, and down there I met Ray Ellsworth Larson. He was a, a, a poet, you know, a nice, a nice poet, we became very friendly. All of, these were all radicals that you met, the people that differed than, any time you had a thought that differed than the average person, you know, accepted, you were radical, see. You said you believed in this. Government ownership of railroads, you're radical. My God, that was terrible. Government ownership of, uh, of the farms or government ownership of industry. They wouldn't have, you know, you immediately, you were out of the picture, you're radical. So I met some of those people there and they were interesting. We'd meet every, every Saturday night at this damn club. And finally one night we were there and there was a, a, a lecture, and the place was raided. This was a, a sex lecture, see, about, and it's raided. There must have been about 50 of us that was arrested. I was stopped in a hotel there, and there was a fellow by the name of, they called this chap Pinky Lowenstein. He was a, sa a dress salesman. And he says, what do you do? And I said, I sell dental supplies. I said, what do you do? And he says, he sells dresses. So I was telling him my racket, and he says, you're in the wrong business. He says, you get into the rest business. That's terrific. So I says, oh, yeah. Anyway, I started thinking, I said, I think I'll do that. I'll go into dress business. This is a true story. I'm from I opened up a telephone book, but who should I go to see here? I turned to the ready to wear section, you know, on the yellow pages. I closed my eyes with a pen, pencil. I go like this, I come down at Aronson. This is the guy I go to see. So I go to see Mr. Aronson. And I told him, uh, also, I'd like to know if you'd like to have a salesman. He says, well, yes, Mr. do you have any experience? Oh, yes, a lot of experience. He says, who can you give a reference? I says, well, I says, uh, a friend of mine was by the name of Moish Rosen in Minneapolis, just retired from the, the dress business. I said, like, wire and find out. He says, okay. He says, this was about Wednesday, I think, or Thursday. He says, come back Friday. I says, okay. In the meantime, I wired Moish. You're in the dress business. Any recommendation, you're going to get a wire. <laughs> I want to I be highly recommended. So why is his back? They wired him. So yes, Mr. Singer a, is a very good salesman, been with us for quite a few years. <laughs> he 
He knows all about the dress business, but we retired now, say. I came back Friday, he says, the line is yours. And he furnished me a truck, you know, a, it's the first truck that I had out, a Ford uh, single truck. So the first time I hit was the cater, I'll never forget it. I hit the cater, and I, I got the man, you know, I got a sample room there for a dollar, you know. Got the stuff open. But I didn't know what was silk, what was cotton, what was the, <laughs> what the fabrics were. I didn't even know what the hell linen was or anything. See, I didn't know anything about it. So uh, this guy comes over. And I, in Africa, I said to him, I said like this, I said, look, mister, I know nothing about this business. Would you please be kind enough and tell me, what is this fabric? He says, that's linen. I said, thank you. What's this? He says, that's oil. <laughs> I said, what's this? See? He said, oh, that's just a cotton dress. Now I says, what's this? He says, that's satin. I didn't know he thought it was satin. Now I says, I'll tell you, I want to ask you another thing. I said, I know nothing about this business. He says, how did you get the job? I says, on the bluff. Tell me, which are the best numbers in this group? He says, all right. He says, he says these are the best. He says, now this is, what, this is what I'm going to buy. Now he says, in showing these, these this group here, concentrate on. He says, push this group. This is a good group. I says, okay, thank you. So I says, thank you very much. And I start putting him back in the box. He says, wait a minute, don't you want to talk to me? I says, well, sure, but I says, I didn't want you to think I was using this as a, as a foil. You know what I mean? Come down and try to slip, put something over. No, he says, I'll buy these. He says, there's four numbers. I'll get you an order for 12 each. So it was 48 dresses. Went on, but couldn't sell anybody else. All day I went from one store to another trying to, you know, sell just one shop. Finally, I came back to the place about four o'clock, and Harrison said, "What luck did you have?" And I said, "Well, I says I sold Sangers." Sangers? I says, "Yes, Sangers." Where's the order? I says, "Here's the order." My God, we've been trying to sell them for a year. We haven't even looked at the stuff. <laughs> That's when he became enthusiastic. And he says, I got your, got the wire. You know, he told me that he, you know, he had the wire and that uh, uh, I took the line out. But my father changed his, had to change his name, see? When my father got into, uh, uh, we got off the boat. What's that island? Uh, Ellis Island, yeah, I think. Anyway, they, they said, what's your name? Oh, he says something like, Yarmanowski, you know. The guy looked at him and says, your name is Sayer. <laughs> that was it. And uh, he was first over, my father was 16 and my mother was 15, the first married. And on the way over, my oldest sister was born on the boat. Well, uh, you know, my dad was a furrier over there. He was very adept in his work. And the hardest job was to match up skins. You know, there aren't any two animals that are the same color. So the mink, you know, would have to be matched just just right. And all the muskrats, you know, they had to be lined up perfectly. And so he made enough money, brought over his brother. And then there was two of them worked, you know, and they brought over the, the rest of them. See, and they all came over on steerage, you know, the cheapest way they could get over. And uh, my father never told me much about his uh, life in Russia. He came from Odessa, Russia. I don't know why. I, of course, at that time, I, I lacked the awareness, I think. I never cross-examined him or said that, that what happened over in uh, Russia, you know, tell me about it. I don't know why I didn't think about it, I just didn't, you know, I took everything for granted. Okay. And that's, that's about it. My dad wasn't too communicative, you know, with me. Of course, he, he uh, had a special feeling for me because 
I had seven brothers that passed away due to the fact that there was no doctors, there were midwives that were taking care of the birth. And the result would be that some of the babies that arrived lived two months, three months, say. And uh, he was afraid. That, and my mother was very sick and he was afraid that I had passed away. But they got a Negro man and his wife that lived about two blocks from the house. And they took care of me for a year or two. All I can remember is they had a pony. <laughs> I was back and, you know, I was thinking to myself, I remember the time that my mother passed away, and during the funeral, I didn't know what it was all about, but I do remember being out on the curb, see, playing in the mud, mud pies, you know, and I saw all these people in the house that's in my mind, you know, there's people there, I didn't know what happened. I don't know, it must have been about four years old or so. Four or five. This was something. First job I think I had was the job selling booze to the farmers. Where they had local option. Oh, yes, and then I also sold papers on the, on the, on the streets. Yeah, my father didn't like it. Even if my father had lived, told me what was wrong and what was right, uh, I probably would have doubted them. I didn't, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't know whether I would accept it 100%, but I may, may have. But my aunt, he didn't they tell me anything that was wrong or was right. My sisters didn't tell me that well, what was wrong, what was right. Sisters were all no good either. Uh, my father, you know, didn't tell me. What do you mean my sisters weren't any good at that? Um, I have, uh, as far as my values are, of right and wrong, I have no values of right and wrong. Everything is right if you feel that you want to do it. <laughs> it's maybe wrong to someone else, but it's right to you, and therefore you go ahead and do it. That's all there is to it. On behalf of my wife and three kids and my grandchildren, I wish to thank you for listening to me. <laughs> oh, why should I have been telling? I haven't been telling any lies. I'm telling you the truth, honey. <laughs>